All right, let's do some examples of the interior product to get a sense for it. So let's look at a two-form in R2, namely alpha uh, is just going to be dx wedge dy. So that's just, you put the grid for the stacks for dx and dy together. Um, in other words, this is the two-form that if you um, want to know how it evaluates on two vectors, you make the parallelogram of those two vectors, and then you just count how many grid boxes are inside that. Okay, so that's straight from the, the uh, intro videos. So what if I did the interior product um, I e1 on dx wedge dy? Well, e1 just looks like this. Just the basis vector going in the, the first coordinate direction, the x direction. So what do I want? I want to create a new, a one form. So just uh, stacks going in one direction such that if I took that E1 and I took some other vector V and made the parallelogram, that doesn't look very parallel, does it? Sorry about that. Okay. If I made this thing that's supposed to be a parallelogram anyway, um, then the area, the result is supposed to be that the area of the parallelogram formed by uh, E1 and V. So that's alpha, or dx wedge dy, acting on E1 and V. Okay, and it's really the oriented area. We might have to be careful of signs here. Okay. That's supposed to equal my mystery one form. I'm trying to define this, trying to figure out what it should look like, acting only on V. Well, let's think about that, okay? What's the, uh, the base of this parallelogram here? It's one unit base, and then the height is just how many stacks of the y stacks does v go through, okay? So this is just the base 1 times the height. Well, that's just dy acting on v. Oh, okay. So the mystery form acting on v is supposed to be dy acting on v, okay. So that means that I E1 on dx wedge dy, the E1 and the dx kind of naturally pair together here and leaving the dy. Okay. Now, it turns out, if we look at the orientation issue, um, if we did I E2, one of the things that was nice is that E1 and V in that order is the positive orientation. Okay, dx wedge dy says I'm going to give a positive number that's something where I describe it as a vector that's kind of more in the x direction and then something that's more in the y direction in that order. It's an oriented area. So if I switched it, if I looked at IE2, then I'm going to end up having the same kind of parallelogram picture but oriented oppositely. So I claim that um, oops, IE2 of dx wedge dy, okay? Now the missing direction, the height, so to speak, of the parallelogram is going horizontally. So that would be dx acting on the new vector, but the orientation switch was gonna be a minus. I know that's quick, but that's hopefully something that's not too hard to believe. Anytime you look at um, differential forms, if you switch the order of anything, you're gonna get a minus sign. Okay, so, um, you might think, okay, is it really special? Am I not going to be able to understand this if the E1 and the DX don't match exactly? Not really, because uh, one really important thing to remember about this whole double grid picture is that, yeah, let's draw my axes again, okay? Uh, so let's do, let's do this. Let's say we have I, uh, U, again of dx wedge dy. So we're going to have that same grid. That's just the area form in two dimensions. It's just the thing that measures area. Now, if you think about that, I shouldn't need to draw a grid in any particular direction to say the thing that measures area. And that's going to be crucial in just a second, okay? So now the u is going to be some random vector. Okay, so there's u. 
Now, I could just use linearity. This thing's supposed to be, everything's supposed to be linear here. And then I could just say, well, I, I think I just figured out what IE1 and IE2 do, so I can probably figure out what I of a sum of those guys does. But I want to think about it more geometrically, okay? And one way to do that is just to say, you know, dx wedge dy, this grid, that's one way to mark out unit area blocks in the, in the, uh, in the plane. But you know what? Oh, I'm going to erase everything. You know what? I don't have to mark it out that way. So let's leave you the way it was. I could instead use a grid that purposely is aligned with you. And then I could choose the other direction for the grid to be pretty much anything I want as long as the grid squares um, have unit, or the grid parallelograms, they don't even have to be squares, have unit area. So I could go perpendicular, but that would kind of make it look too special. So let's just say. Um, Let's just say they go like this. And I'm just going to try to make sure they kind of look like about the same area that I had before. Okay. Alrighty. So another way to say that is I'm just going to rewrite dx wedge dy as, let's call it, um, beta wedge gamma, where these stacks are the beta stacks and these stacks are the gamma stacks. Although, actually, let's see. What do I want? Um, no, I want to be a beta because I don't want to change the orientation, okay? Uh, I had it dx wedge dy, so dx was kind of going more in this direction and dy in this more this direction. If I switched it around, um, then it would be minus, because so, orientations do matter. Okay, now, what's the deal? Okay, I want something so that if I in include, I have this, and then I put in another vector and I measure the area, v, that I want some sort of stack so that when I measure the um, the area of the parallelogram, it's the same as just operating with that stack on B. Oh, okay. Well, that's just going to be um, that's just going to be the gamma stack. Okay. Now I realize I did one thing wrong. Let's see. I think I need to redraw the picture one more way. Yeah. Um, there we go. I do want to be careful. Let's redo this. I do want to be careful about some factors here. So what I'm doing, I'm going to do you like that. Okay. So what I'm going to do is make sure that the horizontal stack, um, or these stacks that go this direction, gives me exactly one on you. There we go. That's what I forgot to do. Now I'm going to have to make the other spacing rather tight to make these areas just equal to the same. There we go. Okay, so that's more analogous to the picture we had before, that you, in the previ previous picture, E1 just hit one exact stack of the dx's. So just redraw it with beta here and gamma here, okay? Um, and again, the gamma stack and the directions of these guys, they, you can choose them to be perpendicular if you want, but I wanted to emphasize that's not really important, okay? Now, the claim is that that's going to be exactly just uh, gamma, okay? And so what it basically does is it just takes, it erases the stacks that you goes through, and it keeps the stacks that you goes along. Okay, so that's, okay, and so what I'm using here is if IU beta is exactly 1, and if IU gamma, I've chosen it so that IU beta was exactly one, that it hits one, one, goes from one stack to the other, to the next one, and IU gamma is zero. Okay. So, this actually relates very well to um, some general facts about how the eyes relate to the wedges, which we'll get to soon. Okay. Let me do just one more uh, geometric picture, though, to not make it too algebraic, because it's going to get pretty algebraic pretty soon. Let's just look at three dimensions. We'll do a quick version here. Um, let's take dx wedge dy in three dimensions. The way we want to visualize that is it's a bunch of cardboard tubes kind of going up in the z direction. And there is an orientation issue, and I'm going to kind of finesse that because it's going to come automatically once we do the algebra. And that's usually indicated by kind of a swirliness in the tubes. Okay, So here's the picture of dx wedge dy. I guess that should be green if I was going to follow my previous convention. Okay, and now I'm going to take a vector, once again, u, 
and I'd like to figure out what u, i u of dx wedge dy in three dimensions is. Well, it should be very similar to the previous example, and in fact, it totally is. Um, the main thing is that it doesn't matter at all if u is this way or if I add um, some multiple of the e3 vector to u. It's not going to notice how much u is going along the direction of these tubes. Okay? The reason for that is that if I build a parallelogram with u and some other vector like this, and then I add to everything, I add some multiple of E3, that's just going to shear it up and down. It's not going to affect how many of these tubes get cut. Okay, so to visualize this, just first project, ooh, not product, project into the plane, and then you get the old picture. Okay, then you get the picture of Here's dx which dy, and here's the vector, and then we have this strategy of first rewrite, I keep changing my axis colors, redraw the grid so that one of the directions is parallel, and so that this only goes exactly one grid square, like this. But make sure that the area is still one. So these are going to be actually have to be very closely spaced together. Okay. And then what it hap what happens is you just erase the ones that goes through and leave the ones that it's parallel to. Okay. So that's the 2D picture. What does that correspond to in 3D? Well, you just that's the top view. of the 3D picture. So the final 3D picture is going to be um, a bunch of parallel plates like this. Okay, and one thing that's really interesting, in all cases what we're getting is something where the U is along the final plates in two dimensions, three dimensions, and that's going to be true always. What that's uh, saying, and here's something, one of our first things that's interesting about the interior product operation is it if I do IU twice on anything you're gonna get zero okay that's not hard to prove from the algebraic definition but we're kinda getting a hint from that from the geometry okay now we're gonna go go fully into the algebra in the next video